Hello, my name is Pastor Esther Rosario, and on behalf of Woodmar United Methodist Church, I welcome you to our online worship service in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I had shared for the past couple of weeks that we were going to be reopening our building for worship on July 19th, but due to the uptick in positive coronavirus cases in our region, our church council um, has chosen to postpone the reopening of our building for worship until August 9th. That's tentatively August 9th, barring any more increases in coronavirus cases. We are still encouraging people who are most vulnerable to continue worshiping online at home. And one day this will all pass and we will be together again. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul as we prepare our hearts for worship. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Thanks be to God. to receive gifts? That's a silly question, isn't it? Do you like to give gifts? Well, I'd like to share with you today one of the most special gifts I've ever received. My sweet girl made this for me for Mother's Day many, many years ago, and it sits on the bookshelf in my office, and it reminds me every time I look at it it reminds me of how much she loves me and how much I love her. So I'd like to suggest to us, to all of us today, that when we give gifts, 
the cost doesn't matter. What's important is the meaning behind the gift. So we might gift someone with a coupon that says, let's spend a day together. That's a beautiful gift. Or it might be a homemade craft, like the one Olivia gave to me. That's a beautiful gift. And it might be something you bought at the store too. That can be a beautiful gift when it reminds someone of how much you love them. So let's be good gift givers. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for how much you love us. We thank you, Lord, that with what you have given us, we are able to give to others. So help us to give in such a way that shows others that we love them because we love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Today's gospel lesson may be found in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Welcome to week two of the Advent Conspiracy. Now, if you didn't hear the message last week, you may be wondering why I'm preaching a sermon series entitled The Advent Conspiracy in July. Here's why. Last December, I preached this series and I realized that this is something we need to be thinking about all year long. And we especially need to be thinking about it prior to the holiday madness which descends upon us in December. We want to be prepared to keep a holy perspective through the temptations of overspending, running around like chickens with our heads cut off, and just generally getting caught up in a cultural Christmas that sucks the life out of us. Advent is a holy time. It's meant to be a time of introspection and growing deeper in our faith as we prepare for the coming of Christ. During Advent, we are invited to enter the deep, life-giving waters of the Incarnation to become a participant in the story of Jesus. And not just a participant, but one who savors and treasures the story of Emmanuel, God becoming one of us, in order to be with us. The authors of the Advent Conspiracy suggest that our first response is to worship God fully every day of the week because our hearts are formed by what we worship. Today we're focusing on spending less. No one may determine for anyone else how much one should spend on Christmas gifts or any other gifts. This is truly a matter between an individual and God. That being said, it is healthy and good for us to reflect on this as the body of Christ, then to further reflect during the week to determine what lifestyle changes we might need to make in order to best honor our Savior all year long. It all boils down to living a life of simplicity. Often when we talk about the spiritual disciplines, we focus on reading and meditating on scripture, praying, worship. Simplicity is also a spiritual discipline. 
Are you familiar with the Shaker tune, Tis the gift to be simple? Tis the gift to be simple, Tis the gift to be free, Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, And when we find ourselves in the place just right, T'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. When we reduce our stuff load at home and spend less on things that aren't truly necessary, we are freed up to direct our attention elsewhere. Not only are our finances more freed up, we too are freed from the burden of taking care of too much stuff that just collects dust in our homes. We closed on our house in Valpo on December 20th, and my perfect plan was to sort and get rid of stuff before moving, but it just didn't happen. So I've been working on going through many, many, many boxes and perhaps the stuff we've accumulated served a purpose at one point in our lives. But the only thing it's doing for us now is cluttering our home. Thankfully, we're able to participate in the neighborhood garage sale and our stuff will hopefully become someone else's treasure. And the money we receive for the garage sale will go towards helping to replace the flat roofs of our church. Having this purpose for our stuff gives me energy to take care of it. In his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard J. Foster states, the Christian discipline of simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. Both the inward and the outward aspects of simplicity are essential. We deceive ourselves if we believe we can possess the inward reality without its having a profound effect on how we live. Simplicity sets possessions in proper perspective. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When we have too many possessions, we become enslaved to them. They rob us of precious time because we have to take care of them and dust and organize and organize and reorganize ad nauseum. They rob us of energy we could use for building relationships with our neighbors. It's not healthy to get so attached to things that we say, I love that. I can never get rid of it. I can hear my great aunt Madge's voice whispering, don't love something that can't love you back. Jesus also said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. To begin the process of practicing the spiritual discipline of simplicity, we can begin by asking ourselves simple questions like, how many coats do I really need? John the Baptist says if we have two coats, then we should give the second one away. Now, did he mean if we have two winter coats, raincoats, spring jackets? first world problems, right? Or how about asking, how many pairs of shoes do I really need? Or how many you fill in the blank do I really need? What are we teaching our children and others with the gifts we give them or the stuff we have? Now please understand this message is not about the evils of gift giving or having things, not at all. Gift giving is a beautiful thing. And having some things is necessary. It's all about moderation and keeping all of life in a holy perspective. All of life. Spending less doesn't mean spending nothing. 
It means striving to thoughtfully evaluate how we're using the financial gifts with which God has blessed us. Every week, when I pray the prayer of dedication of our tithes and offerings, I begin by saying, Almighty God, all that we have comes from you. That's not a mistake. And that's not because I can't think of anything else to say. I speak that because it's true. And we need to be reminded often that all that we have comes from God. We are simply stewards of what God has given us. Remembering that helps to sharpen our awareness of how we are managing God's resources. I wonder what would happen if we started asking ourselves before making any purchases if this expenditure is glorifying to God. Would we go through with it? It's a sobering reflection, isn't it? The authors of Advent Conspiracy say this, how strange and sad it is that debt and consumerism reach their pinnacle on the morning we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Savior who came to liberate us from these things. The most meaningful gifts aren't necessarily the gifts that cost the most. The most meaningful gifts are those gifts that are prayed about and thought about with the receiver in mind. What matters most to them? How can this gift touch their hearts in a special way? Some of the most meaningful gifts I've ever received have been gifts to which time is attached or a gift that has been created by the giver. One year, Christopher gifted each member of our family a coupon that read, this entitles you to dinner and a movie. One-on-one -on -one time with our loved ones is precious and has eternal value. This type of gift will not decay or spoil or fade away. And that's what it's all about investing in eternity, building the kingdom of God now by the way we live every single day. So I ask again, are we willing to free ourselves from the shallow story of cultural Christmas and enter the deep, life-giving waters of the incarnation? Are we willing to worship fully and spend less for the glory of God and for the sake of the world. May it be so. Amen.
draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the before the throne of grace. O oh, loving God, hear us as together we offer up to you our prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And I invite you to, to offer up your prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, O Lord, as together we pray for the people of our congregation. For healing, we lift up to you Mark Vukovic, Ellen Johnson, Becky Craig, Jane Love and her daughter Lynn, Bill Austin, Karen Wasatsky, Judy, Betty Barnhart, Little Peyton, Jackie O'Day, Jeff Stratton, Geraldine Speakman, Phyllis Farini, George Franklin, Brian Franklin, Don Stratton, Dan Cerullo, Teresa Hellams, Joe Shea, Nikki Farley, and a friend who has just recently learned that she has serious health concerns. We pray for peace for Joseph and Jackson. We pray for comfort for the family of George Sims. And I invite you to lift up those the Lord brings to your heart and mind. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Hear us, O Lord, as together we pray for the concerns of our hearts, for our local communities, our nation, and our world. Lord, we lift up to you those related to our church family who are on the front lines caring for people during this pandemic. Rebecca and Jeff Orange, Jenna Orange, Sandy Arndt, Lori Jones, Debbie Pirtle, Shannon Brambert, Gracia Gonzalez, Jennifer Link, Beverly S., Brett, Holly, Sarah, and Becky Bach, Jordan Delgadillo, Kathy and Chet Casper, Tracy Anderson, Amanda Anderson, Sarah Gustalisi, Ashley, Jessica, Amy, Jamie, Cheryl, Danielle Romero, Bria Mangerson, Monty Hoover, Danny Shambaugh, Bailey Smith, Daniel Moore, Lauren Roach, Sarah Fott, Claudia Craig, Camille Jankosik, Rachel Washburn, Kara Stillwell, Peggy Eiler, Joellen Clute, Emma, and Mark Barranco. And I invite you to lift up the concerns of your hearts for our local communities, our nation, and our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that you hear the prayers that we speak out loud and the prayers that we quietly hold in our hearts. Help us to trust you and to lean into you and to lean into each other during these troubling times. We are thankful, God, that you call us your own that we are your beloved children. Hear us now as we, your children, pray the prayer of Jesus' heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move.
make a difference in the world. Yes, that is who we are. We are beloved children of God who are called to make a difference in the world by worshiping God fully every single day and by being good stewards of the resources with which we've been entrusted. And may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all today and remain with us forever. Amen.